Take your Bibles over to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. Hallelujah, it's good to be saved. Amen. Luke chapter number 2. I can just let you know that I'm not preaching 20 minutes this, tonight. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. All right. Luke chapter number two, verse number one. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Amen. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping uh, watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Father, we love you. Father, you're an awesome God and a powerful God. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your long suffering. I thank you for your comfort. I thank you for the wonderful peace that passes all understanding. I thank you so much for the precious blood that your son shed on that old rugged cross to wash away every single sin. And Father, I just thank you for that wonderful, powerful blood. Lord, I thank you so much for the wonderful word of God you've given us, Lord. And God, I pray, dear God, you'd bless the preaching of it tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help me, guide, direct me, and fill me, and use me as I preach your word. And I pray, dear God, that each one of us would have uh, open ears and eyes to see. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that each one of us would be able to receive what you have for us tonight. Help each one of us in a special way. We sure do love you. We praise you. We thank you. You're just an awesome God. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. The power of his blood we plead. Amen. Luke chapter number 2, we see here in this passage, of course, the birth of our Savior. We see the announcement of His birth. We see all kinds of different things taking place here in this passage. And, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, when I stop and think about it, you know, we, me and Mrs. Frost, we were sick for literally three weeks and uh, to the place where, I mean, it really was hard to really get up and do anything because we were zapped of our energy. And, and you know, uh, uh, those three weeks, I was like, this is not the way things are supposed to be. 
this isn't the way this is supposed to be going in my life right now. I don't want to be home, sitting at the house, uh, sick, uh, sitting in my recliner, indenting it with my body shape for three weeks. I don't want it to be that way. I don't want to sleep 22 out of 24 hours a day. I, this is not what I want to be doing. And especially on Sunday and, and Wednesday, I was not a happy camper. And so, you know, but the Lord does all things well. He has a purpose. He has a plan. I've entitled the message, This Isn't Going the Way I Think It Should. This isn't going the way I think it should. And boy, life is that way. You know, in life, you know, it's wonderful when we can just be in life and things are going the way that we would like them to go and everything's happening the way we want it to happen and all of these kind of things. But you know, the truth of the matter is, the more you try to live for God, listen, the more the attacks will come. And listen, as you continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's going to allow things into your life to help you to become more like Jesus. You know, when you think about the Lord's life and you think about how everything took place from his birth all the way through into his, uh, uh, what his twilight years were, his early 30s, and the things that took place in his life and the opposition that he dealt with, and the, the persecution he dealt with, the, the false accusations and, and everything right up until his crucifixion. And then even after he was resurrected, that some of the disciples didn't even believe until they saw, unless I, Thomas said, unless I put my finger in the print of his hand and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's a pretty blatant statement. Would you not agree? But man, I'm telling you, God is awesome. And he has a reason and a purpose why he does things. And so as we jump into this, this isn't going the way I think it should. And I kind of think that Joseph and Mary maybe probably were thinking that when the things were taking place the way they were taking. All of a sudden, they get a tax assigned, and they have to go pay taxes. And everybody loves to pay taxes. Can I get a witness right there? We all just love paying taxes. Amen. I love having, having a, a large portion of my, my finances go to pay taxes in our lives. I mean, that's just a wonderful thing, you know? <laughs> and, you you know, we complain about it, but in reality, honestly, I don't know about you, but I enjoy paved roads. <laughs> don't you enjoy paved roads? I enjoy the U.S. military protecting us. Yeah, I mean, that money does have to come from somewhere. And so anyways, they had to go and pay a tax. But the thing about the tax they had to pay, it wasn't a tax to Israel. It was a tax to Rome. That wasn't their nation. Are you with me? These people were in bondage to the Roman Empire. And so anyways, we look at this, we see this. I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing. This isn't the going in the way I think it should. God brings the most inescapable, inconvenient, inconceivable events into our lives to bring about His incredible purpose and plan. And many times I think this is such a big thing that we try to do is we try to control every aspect of our life. And the truth of the matter is, is we cannot do that. We have got to let God do what He's going to do. The things that come into our life do happen for a reason. The problems that happen, listen, you try to avoid those problems, they're just going to repeat themselves over and over again until you're willing to go through it with the Lord. You can't escape these things that God wants to bring you through as a child of God. You have to go through them because God does have a purpose behind why He does what He does. Are you with me? Listen, this tax was not a mistake. Joseph and Mary needed to go to Bethlehem. Are you with me? They needed to go there because it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Are you with me? These things had to happen. These things had to take place in their life, and it had to take place because it was God's plan. These things were inescapable. This trip that they had to take in the twilight of her pregnancy, and she's getting ready to have this kid. And you can only imagine what it must have been like. If you've ever had to travel anywhere with somebody who's pregnant, it can be miserable, amen? I remember when, when Julie was pregnant with Devin and, uh, and Sam, actually both of them, both of them, couldn't have the kid where we were. We had to drive from North Carolina all the way back up to Maine to have these kids. I mean, it's crazy. You know, it was crazy. Sam's, she's pregnant with Sam, and we're in North Carolina. I'm stationed at Fort Bragg. Well, I don't like the doctor. 
okay. <laughs> and so we travel all the way up to Maine, and she starts seeing her doctor up there. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. And so I'm traveling back and forth. And you know, and when we traveled up and she was pregnant, I mean, she was like, what, two weeks out? It was something along those like two or three weeks out. And she had was, she was having toxemia. She was having high blood pressure and all of that kind of stuff. So as soon as I got her there, I turned around and left. I went back because I had to work. It was a long weekend. And as soon as I got back, and that Monday, I'm like, I'm getting a phone call. You better come back. I'm going in the hospital. And I'm like, what? And so literally, I'm driving because at that point, from where we were traveling from North Carolina, it was like 20 to 22 hours to get from there to northern Maine. And so I'm traveling. I get back. I mean, I've already driven it once to take her up there. I come back and get here. And that day, my first day back to work, I have to go all the way back again. And I'm like, man, I'm telling you, I had visions and grandeur while I'm driving. I'm seeing shadowy shoot. Um, sh I told you the story about the moose I seen in the middle of the road in Bangor, slammed on the brakes in the middle of the night, and there was nothing there. I was dead asleep. The last thing I seen eight miles prior was a moose sign, a moose warning sign. And I'm passing, I'm just about out of Bangor, that last underpass where the mall is and stuff. And that's where I wake up and I'm like, and I see this shadow across the road from a tree and it looked like a moose to me. And I slam. I'm on the brakes. And I was like, oh, not a moose. And so scary, amen. I'm awake now. I'm awake now. Yeah, absolutely. Had the windows down, head hanging out the window, you know. And so, anyways, it was crazy. That is not the way I would want that to go. But you know, it was a good thing that we did it that way because her doctor did a wonderful job. And so praise the Lord, because those doctors in North Carolina weren't putting her in the hospital, and she needed to go in the hospital. So she was in the hospital for 12 days before she had Sam. And so, you know, it's an amazing thing. God does all things well. And so this, these taxes, they were there for a reason. These things that took place, they happened for a reason. They had to go to Bethlehem. The babe needed to be born in Bethlehem. And from everything that we can tell, they stayed there. They stayed there. And so, and two years later, two years later, the wise men come, they show up, and there's no mistakes, and from Bethlehem, they run off to Egypt because Herod was going to kill the kids. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And so, they needed to be in Bethlehem, and from Bethlehem, they went to Egypt because God does all things well. And the things that were, the, as a matter of fact, the children of the two-year-olds and under in Bethlehem that took place is also prophesied in the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number 1, the Bible says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. This taxing had to take place. That trip had to take place. All of these things had to take place in their life. Was it convenient? No. Was it hard? Yes. Was it exhausting? No doubt. The trip was like, I think it was some 40 or 50 miles, and most likely they walked it, and she's like almost due. If you think about it, it's incredible. There's no, and in the story, there's no mention of a mule or, 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 or a donkey, okay? There's no mention in the Bible of her traveling on a mule or a donkey. Now, I know that's the popular story, but you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. And so anyways, as you look at this and you see this, this must have been a very difficult trip. In those days, you know, there wasn't a train, there wasn't a plane, there wasn't a car. They didn't even have bicycles, amen? And so, listen, that had to be difficult. And so, and not only that, all of these things that took place. And so, it was just difficult. And then when they got there, it wasn't easy either. I mean, when you stop and think about this, this had to be difficult. And, you know, they were originally from Bethlehem. That's why they had to go back there. But they didn't have any family there, because if they'd have had family there, they would have stayed with their family. Are you with me? But they were looking for refuge in the inn, but there was no room in the inn. And so it was unfriendly, unfamiliar. It was rough. It was a difficult situation. And all this time, I mean, we're talking about God's son being born. And God let his son be born in a manger. 
Now, I know that you ladies all wanted to be, have your kids when you had kids. I know you wanted to have them in a barn with hay, with mules and ducks and chickens next to you and surrounding you and quacking and all of that stuff. I know that was the dream birth location to have your kids. I know it was. And all that cleanliness that's in those places, you know. I don't know. You know, I've just seen these places where, where animals are now, especially now I have firsthand experience watching Devin and Kristen's chickens. And you go into the chicken coop, and I'm sorry, but when you pick those eggs out of there, they're not clean. As a matter of fact, some of them are downright disgusting. And so I went in there this last time. I collected some eggs, and and she just got done laying this rascal. And I was like, I reached in there, and the it was still slimy on the outside. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I pulled it up, and there's this long, drippy thing. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It wasn't that bad at all, but that was kind of funny to see your reaction. And so anyways, you know, it's not a clean environment. And so, I, you know, I mean, just a, you know, but she never complained. We never hear of any complaints. We never hear of any groaning. We never hear of any, any fussing. Man, I just wish that we could be that way. You know, because when things aren't going the way I want them to go, I can tend to be a big baby. <laughs> don't ask my wife. <laughs> and you don't say a word. <laughs> and so, you know, we have a tendency to do that, don't we? When things don't go the way we want them to go, we have a tendency to complain. And so these things that took place, none of it was convenient. Every bit of it was difficult. It was hard. This is, I'm sure this is not the way she imagined having her first child. You know, every, every, I, I would imagine most every girl would dream of, of getting married and, and the romance and, and the, the wedding and all of those things and having their first child and all of this and their wedding wasn't accepted. I mean, you go to Matthew and you look at the story there about Joseph. She literally, you want to know why she went and visited Elizabeth? Because of the persecution that was taking place in her town. That's why she went there. And you look in Matthew, you see that story and all of those things. And Joseph was going to put her away privately. But God said, no, don't you dare, amen, don't be afraid. That child is of me. And so, and we see everything take place there. It's an incredible thing. Let's look at Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter number one with me. Matthew chapter number one. I want you to see this. I'm going to go to a few other places here in just a moment. Oh, what a blessing. There's no clock. Amen. Great idea, Dev. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number one. Look at verse number 18. If you're there, say amen. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the what? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, which was the law, by the way, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Now, I believe it was Jesus that appeared to him. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, say it with me, Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful name? I'll tell you what, when I hear that name, I get awful riled up, amen? amen. Just like Devin said, man, I love hearing his name. For, <clears throat> for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Amen. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. He was a just man, and he did what he was told. Amen. And so we see this take place, and it must have been a difficult time. It must have been a hard time for them being shunned by family and friends and their religious community and having all of these things take place. It must have been so very difficult. None of this 
was the way that they would have desired it to be. <clears throat> Look at, uh, go back to, to Matthew. Go back to Matthew. I want you to see this. Look at, uh, let's see this here. Where is it? Matthew and Luke. Let me think. It's Luke. Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. Look at verse number 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Isn't it a wonderful thing? Every time that God shows up in people's life in the Bible in this way and they're afraid, they immediately put down their fear. They, they say, Fear not, don't be afraid. Just like when the disciples were in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and the storm was all around them and they saw Jesus walking on the water and they were affrighted thinking it was some spirit. And he said, fear not, it is I. Aren't you thankful for that? Jesus does not want us to be in fear, amen? And so behold, thou shalt conceive, verse number 31, and, and uh, verse number uh, yeah, 31, behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his uh, kingdom, there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she all hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy what? Word. And the angel departed from her. So she willingly took this on. And no doubt she understood what it meant. And he was, as you know in the story in Matthew, this takes place, he finds out. Are you with me? He's going to put her away privately because she didn't want, he didn't want her to be publicly stoned. Because that was the, the, the being found with child out of wedlock, that was the punishment for the Jews in that day. That's what it was. And so as you look at this and see this, she was willing to take that risk for God to do what God wanted her to do. That's incredible to think about. What are we willing to risk to do God's will? What are we willing to allow the Lord to take us through so that we can be better used of God? And look at what it says, and Mary arose in those days and went in verse number 39 into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her what? Womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? And so she went to Elizabeth's house and the mountain country to get away from the persecution. That's why she went. And then when it was time, they came together, they had their marriage or whatever they did. I don't know if they had to do it privately or what. The Bible doesn't really give us an answer to that. And so you know, that would be my guess. The wedding that she always dreamed of probably never happened. Are you with me? She sacrificed a lot in order to do God's will. And so did Joseph. So did Joseph. Both sides of this, it was difficult for both of them. And so this was a major inconvenience, a hardship, a battle, a struggle. Really, persecution was brought on them for doing what God wanted them to do. And boy, we shouldn't be too far off to expect such the same treatment. When we love God and when God tells us to do something, if we'll do it, 
You think about the blessings that they received and all of these things that took place in Mary's life to be able to actually see so many miracles, to be able to be a part of such an amazing ministry that Jesus had. Are you with me? To get to raise a perfect, literally a perfect kid, never sinned. Can you imagine the blessing behind that? That's an incredible thing. I have a child, and this one is perfect. All these other little brats over here. <laughs> you know, and I think that's why we see in the book of John that the brothers and sisters didn't really, really treat Jesus too awfully well. <laughs> Can you imagine? And so you think about this. Man, we see this, this incredible thing. This isn't going the way I think it should. And many times in our lives, if we're thinking that, we ought to just step back and say, Lord, whatever you're doing, I'm going to let you do it. Because I know on the other side of this thing, I know that you've got something great, that you're doing something in somebody's life, that you're going to use me in a special way. And man, what an incredible thing that they got to experience the blessings behind it. You know, it must have been hard. It must have been difficult. It had to be such a struggle and a battle. It's, it, it, every part of this just really destroyed all of the dreams that they probably had and imagined in their life. And it literally, no doubt, they carried that for many years. People, especially this crowd, they just didn't forget it really easy. And I think that's why they ended up settling in Nazareth, even though that was also prophesied in the Old Testament. They didn't go back to their hometown where they came from to go to Bethlehem. They ended up settling in Nazareth. And I think it was because they didn't want to be known because of the persecution. And so we look at this, we see this. We often try to avoid inescapable decrees from our king. And that is not what we should be doing as a child of God. When God brings things into our lives, we should just buckle up, hang on, and let him bring us through it. Amen. Go to Romans chapter number 8 with me. Romans chapter number 8. I want you to see this. You know this passage. Romans chapter number 8. And then we're going to go to a few other places. And I want you to just stop and think about. I really can't recall a single person in the Bible that was used by God that didn't face suffering. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28, the Bible says, And we know that how many things? All things work together for good. To them that what? Love God. If you love God, say amen. amen. To them who are the called according to His purpose. If you're saved, say amen. amen. You're called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be what? Conformed to the image of of his son and the really the greatest and most effective way to form us into the image of Christ is by trial by trouble by persecution by distress all of these things this is what causes us to be shaped into the image of Christ to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And why is it for? It all comes down to it's that he might. That he might. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also, say that word with me, glorified. Listen, we don't realize the glorification that we already do have. But we will one day. And when you are in your glorified body and you're in the presence of the glory of the Lord, we'll really be able to sing men song then. Yep. It will be worth it all. Amen. What shall we say to these things if God be what? For us. And if you're saved in here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. He's for you. Who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. 
how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Man, we've got an amazing God. Amen. Now, I want you to think about a few things here. I want you to think about this fact, and I mentioned it just a little bit. We start off in the book of Genesis, and we see in this passage, we see Noah. Did Noah face some persecution? He sure did. As a matter of fact, the only people that would even listen to him was his own family. Everybody else mocked him. Everybody. He suffered. Can you imagine what it must have been like when the rain started coming and the door closed and the animals and him and his family are inside? And no doubt those people that heard about this were outside clawing on the outside saying, let us in. And they had to go through that. And then they had to stay on that boat for how long? And there was only one little window? Think about that. That must have been, yeah, (laughs) it must have been something else in there. But you know what? After about a day and a half, you probably got used to the smell, amen? Probably like, woo, yeah, let's go go clean out some more elephant dung. (laughs) Can you imagine what that must have been like? I did it again. And so anyways, hallelujah. The things I say in my pulpit. And so anyways, you think about it. You think about Noah. The next major character we see. Abraham. You think Abraham had it easy? God said, I want you to take your son up to the top of this mountain and I want you to slay him as a sacrifice. The son that he had been waiting for for how many years? Hundred. And then he's up there and he wasn't going to say no to God. He just trusted God and other things that he went through. You see, all of these things take place. You see, Jacob. Jacob didn't have an easy road. He married two women. You know that's not easy. And then there was the concubine, or the, 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 they weren't concubines. They became concubines, but they were the, the, their two wives' handmaids. He ended up marrying them, having kids with them. Can you imagine what that house must have been like with five women or four women? Amen. Man alive. Crazy, crazy. And then a bunch of kids that were at each other's throat. And what did he lose? He lost his son. It was his favorite son. And I'm thinking about Joseph, the next major character in the Bible. And look what happened to him. His brothers turn on him. They throw him in a pit. They shred the coat of many colors, put it in. They slay one of the sheep. They put the blood on there and everything like that. And they go back and they lie to their dad. Some beast must have torn him apart. And Jacob's heart's broken. And those boys, they threw him in a pit and they were going to kill him. But the oldest brother, Reuben, steps in and says, No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And then, was it Reuben that said sell him? Or was it Judah? Reuben was the one that stopped him from killing him immediately and put him in the pit. And then Judah had, had him, let's sell him and make some money. And they sold him to the Amidonites and sold him for, for some money. And as a matter of fact, he got the same amount of money that Judas was paid to betray him. And listen, and what happened to Joshua? He was sold into slavery. Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's wife keeps attacking him and trying to get him to, to sleep with him. And what happens? Bam, he ends up in prison, falsely accused. And then while he's in prison, he, he, he uh, uh, interprets some dreams for a couple of fellas. And the one fella he interpreted the dream for, remember me when you, you know, forgot him. Another two years he's in prison after that. I mean, I'm guessing that's probably not the way he would have chosen things to happen in his life. But look what did happen in his life. He becomes second to the king. He's in charge of all... Listen, why? Because he was willing to just trust God through everything that took place in his life. And then after Joseph, we see Moses. He steps onto the scene. Did he have it easy? No, not at all. He didn't have it easy. He knew he was supposed to be the deliverer for the children of Israel. And like so many times we are, we're stupid and we take things into our own hands. So he slays an Egyptian and buries him in the sand. (laughs) <laughs> Way to deliver Moses. And then all of a sudden, what does he end up out? He's out in the middle of the wilderness taking care of sheep. 
And for how long? 40 years. Wasn't easy. Wasn't easy. And then, hey, man, I'm telling you, this is one guy I feel bad for. Two million Israelites constantly complaining, miracles done, amazing things. All of these plagues hit Egypt. They see it all take place. They see the parting of the Red Sea. They go across on dry ground. The Egyptian army, they see them destroyed as the water comes caving in on them. Then they get out in the wilderness. They get a little hungry and a little thirsty. And all they do is they start talking about stoning Moses. They brought us out here to die. I wish I was back in slavery in Egypt so I could have some of those leaks. Are you dumb? And so Moses smotes the rock and all of this, and he's dealing with these two million people of complainers and fussers and whiners. And finally, he just, he gets, as he's getting in his older age, you know, older people, they have a tendency to get a little bit of a temper. You know, he probably had blood pressure problems, and they didn't have any medicine back then for that. And so anyways, he blew his top and he smote the rock the second time. And what did it do? Moses, you can't go into the promised land. I'll let you see it, but you're going to die. You've been through all this, and now you don't get to go in. You think that was, well, yes, I understand that, but he didn't get to go into the promised land. He didn't get to go. I'm sure that's the way he wanted it to be. He pled with the Lord. Nope. It's done. Not an easy thing, right? Just each and every one each and every one. Think about David. <laughs> Anointed to be the next king. <laughs> Samuel the prophet, I mean the great man of God of Israel, comes in, anoints him to be the next king of Israel. And what? All of a sudden he's running for his life for numbers of years, and all he ever did under Saul's rule was good. He defeated Goliath. He defeated the Philistines. He was... He was he was taking care of business for him. And he was more loyal to Saul than any other man in all of Israel. And Saul's trying to kill him the whole time. <laughs> but because he continued to trust God and went through those things. Are you with me? And then you've got to take the, you know, the next, really the next major, you go through character after character. Just one character right after another. Daniel, the three Hebrews. Not anybody want to volunteer to, to get thrown into a fire for God? Anybody? Anybody want to get thrown in a den of lions? Anybody volunteering for that? No, nobody wants to go through those things. You go right down the line through each and every one of these people. You get to the New Testament and you go through this. Do you think, hey, listen, Jesus, Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane said, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but what? Thine. Are you with me? None of this is easy. The Apostle Paul, Peter, I'm sure he wanted to be in prison being next in line to have his head cut off. You know, James just went through that. I'm sure James was volunteering. Yes! Woo! We get to get my head chopped off for Jesus! Hallelujah. No, I don't think so. None of them. John the Baptist, none of them. Every single character went through hardships. Every one. Difficulties. I'm sure Esther wanted to risk her life and go before the kings to save the children of Israel. I'm sure that Naomi wanted to lose her husband and her, three, or her two sons and be left with a Midianite woman named Ruth. She didn't see how all that was going to happen. She said, don't call, me, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, bitterness. Are you with me? None of these people wanted to go through these things. But man, what great things came out of their lives. Apostle Paul, I'm sure he wanted to be scourged five times, shipwrecked, stoned to death. Are you with me? Anybody want to have a bunch of people throw stones at you until your head crushes in? No, I'm thinking that's probably painful. <laughs> Are you with me? Not a single one. John the, John, the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. Are you with me? Boiled in oil. All of these crazy things. Peter crucified upside down. Thomas, uh, uh, Timothy thrown off the pinnacle of the temple. 
And they were doing what? Serving the Lord. Life doesn't go the way we want it to. Life doesn't go the way we dream it to be. These imaginations that we have in our mind. All of this stuff takes place. And the truth of the matter is, is when somebody begins to oppose you, you ought to be thinking in your mind, oh boy. Truthfully, you ought to be thinking, instead of getting upset or getting out of, out of shape about it, you ought to be like, oh boy, I wonder what the Lord's going to do with this. That should be the attitude. When something difficult comes into your life, all of a sudden you have a financial upset and you've just been trying to do right by God. It's not time to complain and fuss. It's like, okay, Lord, listen, you promised in your word, if I do right by you, then you're going to do right by me. Come on. I'm telling you, God is faithful and you can trust him. You know, Joseph, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I understand that. After we get past something and we look at it, we see, wow, this is pretty incredible. Joseph said this at the end of his life. After Jacob had passed and his brothers there where they were in Egypt and they were scared that Joseph was going to get his revenge on them and they came and, 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 and were really being very uh, delicate around him and pleading with him and, and whatnot to forgive them and whatnot. And Joseph forgave them long before they ever asked for it. In Genesis chapter number 50, verse number 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Are you with me? And so when we're facing the fiery furnace, when we're facing the lion's den, when we're facing being thrown in a pit and sold into slavery, when we're facing these different things in our lives, be like Daniel, uh, the Hebrew boys were in Daniel 3, 14 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, at, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. O king, whether we burn up in the fire or not, we're delivered. Are you with me? Look at what they say. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Are you with me? And if you know the story, they got thrown in there. The people that threw them in were slain by the fire. And they were in there. Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fire and he seen those three boys. And all of a sudden there was a fourth one in there. And he said, it looks like the image of the Son of God. And he said, come out. And they came out and not even the smell of smoke was on them. Because God is able to deliver. Amen. Amen. The simple truth of the matter is, just get used to the fact that life isn't going to go the way you think it should. As a child of God, that's the way it is. And I'm thankful because if it went the way I wanted it to go, I sure would miss out on a lot of blessings from God. And I promise you, the trouble, the problems, the hurt, the heartache, and there's going to be all of that as a child of God. Just trust Jesus because he is enough. He is enough. He is my everything. We talked about that on Wednesday night. He is faithful. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed.
just want to ask you tonight, will you be willing to go through the proverbial fire? Would you willing to get cast into the proverbial lion's den? Will you let people stone you for the cause of Jesus Christ? I understand we're not in that place yet in our country as far as the physical persecution is concerned. But there are things that we go through as children of God that are hard to understand sometimes. But I can just promise you this. Just continue to hang on to Jesus. Just as Devin mentioned at the beginning, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keep your eyes on him. And let God use you in a special way. Trust him and glorify him just like Mary did, knowing that some of the decisions that she had to make, well, they cost her friends and family, favor from people. But as a result, by being willing to go through those things, she got to experience some pretty amazing things. If God spoke to your heart tonight, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands. You can put them down. Father, we sure do love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray you bless the invitation now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you need to come, you come on. I don't understand a lot of reasons why things happen in our lives. But I'm sure glad I know the one that does. I'm sure glad I know the God that's powerful and compassionate and loving. And he does love us and he does allow things into our lives for our good and his glory.